I want you to understand what is your relationship with God, or what is your perception and understanding of the person of Jesus Christ. There are many names attributed to the Lord Jesus. And you can go to the Bible and read it from Savior and Lord and the Son of Man and the Son of God. Um, however, I want to ask you how and in what capacity do you relate to him in your life? It's very important. So um, if we think we already know him, we're not really being honest. There's a lot that we still have to learn about him. The Apostle Paul, one of the rare person who had a lot of revelation of Jesus Christ, he had an encounter with him on the road to Damascus. He lost his sight and regained it to really see who this Jesus of Nazareth is. However, to the very end of his life, he said, that I may know him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you. It's a knowing, a constant, progressive knowing. And you may say, well, how do I know that I know, and how do I will come to the conclusion that I know it all? Let me make a statement. It, may, it will help you. Spiritual life is a process of coming to know him in his various ministries and positions and learn to trust him in this life, and that is a lifelong process. The moment, in other words, what I'm saying is this. We have to know him. Spiritual life is a lot of knowing. It's not, boom, I know him. It's a lifelong process through different situations, from different circumstances. God will reveal himself more and more and more to, to you. And even if we leave this world, still it's a matter of knowing him, knowing him, and knowing him. So it's very important that we allow the Holy Spirit to reveal him to us as best as possible. So my question to you is, how do you relate to him? And do you have to see him? And so I want to take you to the Gospel of John and show you something that perhaps you already know. But to me, it is a point that the Lord is emphasizing. And I want to share that with you. But we have to understand about the Gospel of John. There's something amazing and, and, and unique about the Gospel of John. It has been written by John in such a way that putting the arrangement in such a way that it is outstanding and amazing. And a lot of things are revealed to us as we look at it, the order of chapters. Specifically, I want to talk about chapters 9 to 12. I could keep the whole Gospel of John, but chapters 9, 10, 11, 12 is outstanding the way the Holy Spirit guided Apostle John to write his Gospel. They are not simple words that the Lord spoke. They have a profound truth. They have a truth which has got to be applicable in our lives. And because they were spoken as God enabled to him. He says, my father gives me that I speak. The words that he spoke were the words that God spoke through his son, Jesus Christ. So it's very significant that when we read the Gospel of John, read it very carefully. I've been reading this Gospel, the whole Bible, for 45 years. And every time I come back to the Gospel of John, I stop. And I say, oh my God, how come I didn't see it? Gospel of John has been keeping me amazed. And I come to it and I see some truth. I stand in awe. It's an amazing Gospel. I'm not putting down the other Gospels. But this is something that every time, after 45 years, I come to that Gospel. I say, oh my God, what a beautiful thing. It's because of the arrangements. The way it has been arranged. However, we're always wrestling in understanding the Word of God in our limitations. Naturally, we're limited. And we cannot immediately understand what God is telling us unless the Lord reveals it to us. Having said all of these and these questions, I want to ask you the same question. What do you know about the Lord Jesus Christ? But before we go to the Gospel of John, and the way God works, I want you to take, take you through the whole Old Testament and the New Testament for one word. It's a simple word. But when you read it through both Testaments, the Old and the New, you're going to see something new about the ministry of the Lord Jesus. And that word is shepherd. 
shepherd. And you're going to say, oh, what is so significant about this word? Allow me, because I want you to see the importance of this word, how you can apply it in your life, what does it mean to you, what did it mean to God, and then our eyes are going to be opened, as my brother said. Oh, so that's what it really meant. So, but before I take you there, I want to point out that this whole Bible, this, not only in here, but the whole of the Bible, this shepherding of God was a known fact to the people of the Old Testament. They realized the importance of God's shepherd and shepherding. I'm going to read a lot of scriptures. You have to bear with me. But I'm trying to make you understand a point. And these are not my words. These are words from the Bible that I'll be reading to you. So bear with me as I read scriptures. The first scripture that shows that these people of the Old Testament knew the quality of God's shepherding, it is in Psalm 80. And this is what we read, verse 1. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. They realize who this God is. The shepherd of Israel. You who lead Joseph like a flock, you who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, stir up your strength and come and save us. O shepherd of Israel, come and save us. They realized it was the shepherd that was going to save them. So, but uh, as much as God had pointed, appointed shepherds for his people, starting from Moses all the way through different shepherds who are supposed to lead these people to the promised land, they failed. And their failure was seriously questioned by God. Did they do their job right? Did they depend on the Lord to do the right shepherding? God expected those people to shepherd his people. He said, I'm appointing you as shepherds to lead these people. And yet, they failed. And this is the indictment that God has, the complaint that God has from the shepherd, because when we go on, I'll show you in what position that it leads us as shepherds. So, in Jeremiah chapter 23, this is what God says to these shepherds. Woe to you shepherds who destroy and scatter my sheep, the sheep of my pasture. My brothers and sisters, it's a serious thing. The people of God are the flock of God. And you may say, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a shepherd, but you are a sheep. Amazing enough, I remember years ago, a brother who was used, used to come to this church, he said, you're always comparing this to animals. I'm sick and tired of being compared to animals. <laughs> He's not with us anymore. But God has a way of explaining to you certain truths that he takes phenomena from nature. Today, all of you are sitting here, you haven't seen a shepherd. Most of you, all of you who are sitting here have not seen sheep, a flock of sheep. It may seem strange to you in the 20th century, but God doesn't change his word. He is telling us a truth that only could be portrayed by the example of sheep and shepherd. Sheep is an animal that doesn't think. Sheep is a simple animal. Sheep needs to be guided. Sheep needs a pastor. She, otherwise, they go astray. They go get lost. They follow their backs and they start to breathe and they swell. And they remain in that situation unless the shepherd comes and turns them over and starts to revive them. In our natural life, we are like sheep. And that's what case you are. Therefore, you need a shepherd. And these shepherds fail to lead them to the promised land. So this is what says to the shepherds of Israel. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of, of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus said the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away, have attended, not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doing, says the Lord. But I will gather the remnant of my flock. There's always that remnant comes in. There's a sheep that says, oh, I don't want it, a kick. God says, I have a remnant in my sheep. I'm going to show you that remnant. A remnant in my sheep. I'll gather them. I'll feed them. I'll be the shepherd. If we're standing on the ground of the remnant, we have to know that God is going to give us shepherds, and God himself is going to shepherd us to the destination. 
and I will be the shepherd of my remnant, the remnant of my flock, out of all countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their fold, and they shall be the, 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 the uh, fruitful and increase. From all countries. Oh, ho. Look around. No, I'm saying to look around. I do not. Look around. From all countries, I will gather them. You are a church that comprises of many nationalities. Why did he say from all countries, I'll find the remnant of my sheep and from all my countries and Greece and shall be fruitful. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them and they shall fear no more, nor dismayed, nor shall be lacking, says the Lord God Almighty. Huh? Shepherd? God? Giving us good shepherds? Jeremiah 50, the same thing. My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. All who found them devoured them. That's what happened to the nation of Israel. Because their shepherds misled them and they were devoured by the Babylonians. And in view of their failures, God promised that himself would undertake to be their shepherds and give them shepherds who would lead them properly. And so we come to Ezekiel chapter 34, another prophet of captivity. For thus said the Lord God, indeed I myself will search for my sheep. Oh my God, he's talking about constantly him being the shepherd and seeking for his sheep. He sought you when you were not, did not know him. He sought, sought you when you were saved. He sought you as a shepherd. He found you and brought you back into the flock. I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so will I seek out my sheep and deliver them from all places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from all the peoples and gather them from countries and will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valley and in the in, in, in inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in good pastures and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lie down in good fold and feed in rich pastures on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock. Are you a sheep of his flock? And I will make them lie down, says the Lord. I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away. Bring up the broken and, broken and the strengthened that which was sick. I will destroy the fat and the strong, and feed them in judgment. I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, my servant David. Amen. David was a king. <laughs> but more than a king, he was a shepherd. He learned the art and the skill of shepherding when he was just a young lad. He fought for the sheep. He fought a bear. He fought a lion for one single sheep. He said, even if one earlobe is left, I'll put it out of the mouth of the enemy. David, more than being a king, was a shepherd. And he looked after God's people to the very end. And he dedicated whatever he had to the building of the house of God for the gathering of the sheep and bringing the flock back to God's house. Who is Jesus to you? Who? He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. The word of God cannot be changed. You may believe in Jesus as the Lord, as the Son of Man, as the Savior, as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and a lot of people have great prophets, but they don't see the shepherding ministry of the Lord Jesus. I will put it all in one thing and I'll prove it. Every ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ is encompassed in this one word, shepherd. 
shepherd. Do you have him as your shepherd? Or just as only as your savior without realizing it takes more to be a savior because he needs to shepherd you also. He needs to take care of you. He needs to feed you. He needs to guide you. And in confirmation of this promise, this is what we read in Isaiah chapter 40. What a beautiful chapter, Isaiah 40. And then it, at the end, it says, this is what he says, Behold the Lord God, Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule over him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. That's not enough. He will gather the lamb with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and gently load those who are with young pregnant sheep. He's going to take care of everything they need. Do you trust him for that care? Has he taken you in his arms? Is he carrying you? Are you as susceptible as a pregnant woman that he carries them? What a picture. If I were a painter, I would probably paint this very picture of the love and the care of God when Isaiah 40 writes it. Well, God is amazing. Other than David, he appointed somebody else which is unique in the Bible to be the shepherd of his people. How can you guess who it was? Who says of Cyrus? Who was Cyrus, my brother? <laughs> Cyrus was the king of Persia. Right now, a despised nation, a nation in chaos. But Cyrus was the king of Persia. Who says of Cyrus, he is my, my shepherd, and he shall perform my pleasure. Saying to Jerusalem, you shall be built, and to the temple, your foundation shall be laid. That's, he says about his shepherding. But in chapter 45 of the book of Isaiah, this is what he says uniquely about Cyrus. Thus said the Lord to his anointed. Not everybody is anointed in the Bible. An anointed shepherd. To Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. Listen to what he's saying about Cyrus. Are we together? Are you listening? Oh, some of the Iranians sitting here are going to be very proud. But that's dead. That passed. To open before him the double door so that the gates will not shut. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places. That you may know that I, the Lord who called you by your name, will be with you. Oh. You know, they realize that a flock without a sheep is a dangerous thing. A sheep without a, flock, without a shepherd is a dangerous thing. That's why the Lord Jesus, the night before he went to the cross, chapter 26 of Matthew, verse 31, this is what Jesus told them. All you will be made stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And that's what happened. That goes on into today. Because the real shepherdhood of Jesus Christ, the real him, we as flock and his shepherd had been forgotten. Very sad story. You're going to say, you're attacking other Christians. I'm not. I'm just stating a fact. Go and listen to the biggies. Well, we'll have to look at the claims of the Lord Jesus. And we have to review the scriptures. 
and then we will find out we have read, we have read all the Old Testament scriptures. And see the claims of the Lord Jesus in the context of what was and is in the heart of God. But before we go to the Gospel of John, I said I'm going to take you to the Gospel of John. I want, I want to read something to you from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Because Pharisees were the teachers who had become the reason of the scattered people. Those false teachers were the reason why Israel went into the captivity of Babylonians. Those false teachers were the one who did not allow these people to be the people of God. Yes, a remnant returned, but yet still they had there were there were shepherds there who were misleading them. And constantly in the day of the Lord Jesus, they did not realize that they were scattered, they were without a shepherd. So in controversy with them, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 15, when the Lord spoke about three lost things, the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son, this is the first one that he brought up. Luke 15, let me read you what the Lord Jesus said. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. People of no reputation, people who were poor, drew near to him to hear what he was saying. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Oh, they want a line of distinction. They want to be separated from poor people. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you having a hundred, a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, go, go after the one which is lost until he finds it. He say God cares so much about a soul that he will do anything to go after him and save it as a shepherd. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me. For I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you likewise, there will be many more, there will be more joys in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 just persons who need no repentance. He demonstrated the quality of a shepherd. Go after one, pick him up, put him on your shoulders, bring home and rejoice. But don't you know what happened to you? Yes. Adam? Do you know that when you were lost, he found you? Do you know he put you on his shoulder? Do you know he brought you and baptized you into the church and rejoiced with you? Or it is a mechanical art. Yeah, he was good. He went to the cross. He died. He saved me. No, 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 no. There are many inerrant real experiences that demonstrate the love of Christ for us by what he has done for us. It's not an indifferent thing. I saved you. Put you on his shoulder. Brought you back. Brought you home. Called everybody. Rejoiced. Over you. Alone. Other than my wife who said thank you. Is there anyone say who can say thank you? Thank you. Now let's go to Gospel of John. <laughs> this was the introduction. Just the introduction. To the Gospel of John. 9 to 12, and my question still stands. Who is he to you? How do you see Jesus Christ? In what capacity is he looking after you and caring for you? Do you see him as our shepherd who is able to take care of you, guide you, protect you? Is he like any other shepherd who fails? So, coming back to the Gospel of John, the order of chapters, I start with chapter 9. I'll be very brief, I'll try to. Chapter 9 is the picture of humanity at large. What did it say that is the picture of humanity at large? Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Humanity as such Natural man is born blind. I'm not talking about a physical seeing. Spiritually, when we are born, we are 
blind. That's the condition of humanity at large. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They tried to attribute that blindness to something natural. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but the works of God should be revealed in him, because God was going to open eye. God is going to open the eyes of those who want to see. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. It, it, the night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. God's desire is not that we remain in spiritual blindness. He wants to open our eyes so we can actually see who he is and what he's done for us and how much he loves us and what is his plan and purpose eternally. So how did it begin, the natural blindness? Back to the book of Genesis. That is where that blindness happened and continues all the way through into all humanity. And when we come to chapter 3, the temptation of Adam and Eve, this is what we read. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise and took of it its fruit and ate. So she also gave it to her husband with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened to the natural and to the death and their spiritual eyes were shut. And they knew that they were naked. The first thing they saw with the physical eyes was their nakedness. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Eyes open to the natural and the nakedness of humanity before God, and they lost their spiritual sight. They could not see from then on anymore. As a result of their disobedience, the spiritual eyes of humanity was completely shut, and this man was an example of all humanity. Every human being without a touch from God is blind. Unless somehow that touch is given to us, and through Jesus Christ, the Lord is giving us that touch to open our eyes so we can see what is his plan and purpose and how, who he is, and we trust our life to him. The rest of the chapter shows the blindness of the leaders of Israel in contrast to the confession of this man. That's chapter 9. So they ask him the questions, who opened your eyes? You're a sinner, you're not supposed to talk to us. This man says, I know one thing, I was blind and now I can see. They said, called his parents and a lot of discussion went on. Then Jesus knew they had kicked him out of the temple. He went and found him and this is what Jesus spoke to him. Jesus heard that they had cast him out and when he found him, he said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking to you. If, listen very carefully, if our spiritual eyes are open, you will see nothing but Jesus as the Son of God. Amen. Keep it, Son of God. We come to chapter 10. Mark my this word is being recorded. I'm not going to change it. Chapter 10 of the Gospel of John is a pivotal chapter that encompasses the whole Bible. I'll tell you why. That's why every time I come to this Gospel, I stand in awe and I say, oh my God. And thus we have to look at it in a very carefully by looking at certain scriptures, it is the chapter that focuses on the sheep and the shepherd and their relationship. And there's one verse in there that is pivotal and covers everything that God wants and Jesus came to do. In chapter 15 of the Gospel of Luke, remember what I read? Jesus said, who the sh good past shepherd is, goes, finds, brings home, rejoices. Now he's saying who that shepherd is. And Luke did not. In John, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climb up some other way, tries to other way to be saved. The same is a thief and a robber. 
but he who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him who the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. Mark it, see how many times he repeats it. And the sheep hears his voice, and he calls him own sheep by name, and leads them out, and when he brings them out, to bring, uh, and then he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet, they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know his voice, the voice of the stranger. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things that he had spoken to them. Do you hear him? He's calling you by name. He knows you by name. Claudia, Edith, Nazi, he calls you by name. He knows you and his name. He's not a stranger to you. He's not indifferent to you. Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. I will go in and out and find pastures. Here, the key verse of the Bible. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that may have it abundantly. That's the whole Bible and the whole gospel. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Well, who is he who comes to give us life? The shepherd. Can you say it with me? Why don't you open your mouth? Say it with me. You know what the verse following that? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. He was taken to that cross like a lamb, but he was the shepherd who went to that cross for your life and my life. I am the good shepherd. For thousands of years, God was looking for this shepherd. Only and only he called Cyrus as his sheep. Oh, what a privilege was that man had. And yet here he says, I am the good shepherd. And I know my sheep. And I am known by my own. And as the father knows me, even so I know the father. And I laid down my life for the sheep. Is he really your shepherd? Has he has laid down his life for you as your shepherd? Yes. I asked you in the beginning, how do you know him? In what capacity do you know him? Savior, right. But who is the Savior? The Savior is not only Savior. The Savior is your shepherd. Guides you, keeps you, feeds you, look after you, puts you on his shoulder, takes you, takes you in his bosom. Oh, my God. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd, the one new man in Christ Jesus, no Jew, no Gentile, no Scotian, no barbarian, no black, no white, no male, no female, no slave, no free. One new man in Christ Jesus from all over the world. Oh, am I the only one excited so much? I'm older of the most of you, and yet I'm excited, and you're sitting there. I am the good shepherd. You need a shepherd. They hear my voice, <laughs> and there will be one flock and one shepherd. As we continue this chapter 10, we're coming to the end of it. I'm going to take you to 11. 
now it's the feast of dedication in Jerusalem. And it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered to them, I told you, and you do not believe. The, whole, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hears my voice. You know how many times it's repeated? My sheep hears my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who is given to me is the greater than I, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Oh my God, aren't you happy that nobody can snatch you out of the hand of the shepherd? Nobody can snatch you out of the Lord Jesus. Nobody can snatch you out of the hand of the Father, because Christ and Father are one. Well, I've always said, I wish we had some dancers here. Because this requires a dancing and shouting and praising because he says, if you are your past, if I'm your shepherd, I am in you are in my hand. Nobody can take you out of my hand. Nobody can take you out of my father's hand. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. What a security. What an assurance. That needs dancing. <laughs> but the Jews were saying, you're blaspheming. You're saying, I'm the son of God. Jesus said, because I say to you, I'm the son of God, if you do not work my wor the works of my father, do not believe me, but I if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. The shepherd and the Father are one. According to the confession of that blind man in chapter 9, and what we read about the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the shepherd are one. Now we come to chapter 11. Why did I bring you all this way to chapter 11? Why this chapter 9 and then 10 and then 11? We come to the story of raising Lazarus from the dead. When you come to the chapter, what do you see? Somebody he loved. He said, Lazarus was a person whom Jesus and his sisters he loved. They're friends of him. And there's a premature death. Lazarus was not an old man. He should have said, okay, he's an old man, he's gone. Something of the enemy had entered into that family. And the sheep was being stolen. And the shepherd was needed. The whole story of chapter 11 and raising Lazarus from the dead is the story of the sheep and the shepherd. So, there's a lot of things the disciples said, uh, he's asleep. He'll wake up. Jesus said, he's not asleep. He's dead. And I go there to raise him up. And they're going to, he said, Jerusalem wanted to kill you. You're going to there to, to raise him up. A shepherd will lay down his life for the sheep. Jesus knew going to the house of Lazarus what it meant. And Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad for your sake that I was there, that, I, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let's go to him. Then Thomas, who is called twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go up with him and die with him. He knows the danger. Now, Jesus comes, and as he's far away, Martha sees him. Martha comes and compliments him, but says, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. And so forth, so on. And Jesus said to him, your brother will rise again. And this is what Jesus told her. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into this world. Again, the confession of the Son of God. But it has to be jointed with the shepherd. The two are one.
Do you remember what I told you in John chapter 10? My sheep hear my... How many times did he say it? Quite a few times in chapter 10 he says it. Now, can Lazarus hear? <laughs> Lazarus is dead. But if Lazarus heard, it means he was a sheep. If he couldn't hear, he was not a sheep. Jesus knew that Lazarus was a sheep. So, he went there and says, when he had said these things, remove the stones. Martha said, he's going to stink. He said, remove the stones. Did I tell you if I you believe you'll see the glory of God? Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. My sheep, hear my voice. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave cloths, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said, loose him and let him go. He heard. He came out. But the grave cloth is still on him. Life in limitation. He's fine, he heard. He's a sheep. He came out. But the grave cloth, the grave cloth are still on him. He still thinks of stinks. The smell of death is on him. But the result of the but the result of this commandment, let him loose and go, leads us to chapter 12. They took the hands, opened the hands, opened the feet, took the eyes off. And let him go. And Lazarus said, Hallelujah, I'm going to go to a bar and get a few drinks. <laughs> Hallelujah, I'm going to go to the nightclub program. The outcome of free hands and feet and uncovered face is testimony, fellowship, breaking of bread, and offering everything to the shepherd. And that's why we come to chapter 12, and this is what we read. Then six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. Something has happened. He's done something to this man that everybody sees. Lazarus was dead. Now Lazarus is living. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Martha previously somewhere else complaining. I work, my sister doesn't work. Now, she's no complaint. Brother is alive. They have a party rejoicing. Remember what? When he brought the sheep back, Luke 15, he called his friends and he said that which was lost is found and they rejoiced and have a party. Here is exactly what has happened. He has brought the sheep back and now they're having a party. <laughs> have you ever been into that party? Have you ever rejoiced? He is rejoicing over you. Have you said thank you? Have you been a testimony? Is there worship? Is there offering? Here is what follows. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. The most expensive thing she had, she offered on Christ because they had experienced resurrection from the dead. The shepherd was there and he wanted to honor the shepherd. So she didn't care, gave. You know, when your hands are open, you start to give. When your feet are loosened, you go and testify. When your face is uncovered, you see. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. And they came not for Jesus' sake, but that they might see Lazarus. People today would see you. We see Jesus, but they will see you. They came to see Lazarus. They want to see the testimony of life in you. 
Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, but the, the testimony of Jesus, you and me, they want to come and see you and say, here is a person in him I see Jesus. Here is a person who will be saved by Jesus. Here is a person who is free in Jesus, hands and feet free, face uncovered. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, on account of him, many Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Do people on that account of us believe? Do people look at my life and say, truly, here is a person who has been touched by Jesus, who has been freed by Jesus. You know, the sad thing is today you see a lot of Christians in the same situation. Hands bound, feet bound, face covered. The very fact that I stated to you about Cyrus and the claim that Christians have shows one thing. There's a death cloth on their faces that they cannot see. They resort to many things, but they cannot see the truth that God's Savior is not going to be a king from Persia. God's Savior is Jesus Christ, the shepherd of shepherds, to save the people. For years they've been Christians. But when you look at them, <laughs> the grave cloth is still on them. They have no testimony of the abundant life. I have come that they may have life, and they have the testimony of life, but not of the abundant life, because the abundant life is a result of free hand, free feet, face uncovered. These we have examples of the churches. The church in Corinth. The church in Corinth was a very natural church. The church in Corinth was acting like the people in the world act. The church in Corinth was taking brother to brother because there was a complaint in the body. They did not reconcile the situation among themselves. Their leaders did not help them to reconcile the situation among themselves. So brother is taking brother to court. That is a naturalness. That's a being bound. That's a grief cloth still on them. Stinking of death. Oh, what is your relationship with your brother or sister sitting next to you? Are we on a natural ground or have been freed? The church in Galatia was going back to legalism, do's and don'ts and feasts and not feasts. Jesus said, what? You're going back to the works of the flesh? They were bound. There was no progress. Feet were bound. No progress. Hands and feet free, that gives you progress. The church in Ephesus had the best teaching. And yet Paul says, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Spirit of wisdom in his knowledge that the eyes of your understanding may be open. This grief cloth shall be moved for you to see who he is and what is his plan and purpose for you individually when he saved you and wants to save you. Church after church. Are we hearing? Are we free? Are we progressing? Are we moving? Are we pressing on? Or still on natural grounds, bound by grave clots, and no further abundant life? Our rapture in the first rapture is dependent on how we hear. Yes. The trumpet is going to be blown. Will you hear it? Or are we still on natural grounds bound by things of this world? My judgment. I read something very interesting. The author said, sometimes we move by logic rather than revelation. Logic than revelation. So what are we moving with, logic or revelation? And at the beginning, I said John 11, verse 10, is the gist of the whole Bible. Are we willing to allow the Holy Spirit to remove those grave cloths if they're still on us? Are we willing for him to open our eyes, to unbound our hands, to unbound our feet, heal our relationships with each other, Because of the abundant life. Amen. 
I have a word for the workers of this church, including myself. Deacons, elders. When the Apostle Paul was going to go to Rome and he was speaking his farewell message to the church in Ephesus, then this is what he told them in the book of Acts, chapter 20. And indeed, now I know that you all among you who I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of Christ, which he purchased with his own blood. My fellow workers, deacons, elders, whoever is ushering, we have been appointed for the church that God bought with his own flood and act like shepherds. If we're failing, it's a very sad situation. Peter said the same thing. The elders who are among you, to the elders among you, I exhort, I am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also partakers of the glory of God who will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gate, but eagerly, nor as lording over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. What do you want the crown of glory? I'm coming to the end. I stand before this congregation and I want to tell you something. If I have failed to shepherd you, I stand here and apologize to you. I apologize. I don't want to come into judgment. If ever I have done something to any one of you has been misleading. I am right now apologizing because I don't want to be a shepherd that comes under judgment. <laughs> and when we come to the end, the writer of the letter of Hebrew reminds us of the majesty of the shepherding of Christ. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Now may the God of all peace who brought up the Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, when we come here, we're celebrating the glory and the majesty of the great shepherd. Make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing well in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And the last compliment to the Lord Jesus, or the last truth about Jesus, is in the book of Revelation. Who do you think in the book of Revelation is going to take care of you? Is going to be there for you? Some of you may have had times of weeping, crying. Are you? Are you weeping and crying? Do you have tears? Do you have sadness in your life? then you better have him as your shepherd. Because when we come to the book of Revelation, this is what we read. So he said to me, these are who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger not only physical, spiritual, mental. Anymore, nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in their midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to the fountains of water, and God will wipe away every tear. Amen. <laughs> 
You want joy? You want your tears wiped away? It is the shepherd who will take you there. He will take you to the very throne of God for him to wipe away your tears. You cannot talk about the shepherding of God without referring to Psalm 23. David had seen it well. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And it ends with, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He had seen it well. He was a shepherd boy. He knew the shepherding of God. I wanted to, to, to excite you, to help you, to invite him in your life as the shepherd, who from the beginning to the end, it is his shepherding ministry which took him to the cross. It is his shepherding ministry which came back in the Holy Spirit. It is shepherding ministry that is appointed shepherd. It is shepherding ministry that he cares and takes care of you and, and, and feeds you. It is his shepherding ministry that ultimately you, he will take you to the Father and he will wipe away your tears. Thank you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Finished. Everything. Have you made him your shepherd? He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil because we are going to go through that valley of the shadow of death. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare me a table before me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The shepherd is the savior. As well as the provider. Everything is encompassed in that one word. Shepherd. My question to you today is, who is your shepherd? In the beginning I said, because it's an old type phenomena that we 21st century people are not familiar with it. But we have to take the word of God the way it is. He's giving us an example. Today, if I ask you who's your shepherd, what are you going to tell me? My shepherd is the Social media, my shepherd is my iPhone, my shepherd is my Samsung, my shepherd is my dad, my shepherd is my mom, my shepherd is my position, my, shame is my, my shepherd is my youth, my shepherd is my money. What and who is your shepherd? If these may give you mental and physical and and more even emotional satisfaction. They can never and never give you spiritual satisfaction and open your eyes to the reality of life. Who is your shepherd? And what is your shepherd?